The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Beaches, cottages, picnics, and barbecue. Summer gatherings include good food, and here in Ontario, delicious and culture meet a vast world of culinary possibility. That's what we'll dish about all week with Chef Joseph Shawana, author and chef Joshna Maharaj, author and journalist Anne Huey, and food writer Marie Fitrion. Tonight, what makes something taste good? That's next on the Agenda in the Summer. So I have a, a little bit of a confession. I love my husband, but the one thing that I can't I stand about this man. <laughs> Go on. Right the or about I love you, world? honey. Yeah. <laughs> he loves Marmite. Um, oh, he's part no. Welsh. Oh, it's, okay. And I've never understood it. I've tried it. I've been open-minded. But any time that he finds out that anyone is traveling to the UK or any of the countries that have Marmite, he's oh, like, boy. can you please bring me some? I don't understand it. So, um, Joseph, let me start with you. Like, in your view, what makes something delicious? Or do you even like Marmite? Because then I'm going to have to move over there. Yeah. No, <laughs> um, f for myself, it's, I don't know, it's just... <laughs> <laughs> That's a weird question. I never got answered. I never got asked that question before. So, uh -huh. but I think that um, the thing that makes something delicious, especially for food, is um, having something made that reminds you of your childhood. Mm -hmm. Right, Love and that, that's the way I cook. This, yeah. A lot of the times, a lot of my recipes are based on my childhood growing up, mm -hmm. um, and most times or not, it's like what would I would what is something that I want to my son to remember from me mm. being in the kitchen yep. mm. right when he gets yep. older because he's at that stage now where he's eight years old he wants to be a chef he's always asking to come work with me in the kitchen he's always asking me to come into my classrooms when i teach and he's been around food his whole life right mm -hmm. so with my mom cooking my grandmother myself and so he's it's it's starting to be instilled into him of what it takes to to cook food and what you should put into it because everything you put into it the, the either the customer or your family will feel that, right? Mm -hmm. So, and that's why I try to play on a lot of my memories growing up. Like, how did I eat this when I was a kid? And how does it represent the way I am now mm -hmm. onto a plate? And just thinking about that, it's like, there's a lot of dishes that I really enjoy mm -hmm. that only my, uh, my mom would cook that I really like cook, but eating, and then what my grandmother used to cook. Um, so I'm interested to know what, um, I guess, motivated you or inspired you all to work with food. Um, and mm. Oh, well, that's an interesting question because I don't technically work for work with food. But covering food, uh, you but did Yeah, but I, I've written about food a lot in the past, and I've written a book about food. Mm -hmm. It's just... You know, I think a lot of it has to do with what you were talking about, Joseph. It, it, you know, food was such an important part of my childhood, such an important part of my upbringing. My dad was a cook growing up. Uh, meals were where we did all of our celebrations, you know, somebody, uh, somebody's birthday or Mother's Day or, or everything was, was celebrated over a meal. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's just always been a really important part of my life. You know, before I think food became cool in the last couple of decades, yeah. I think many of us had yeah. already recognized what an important part of That's right. of, of life. So it did was. it become cool because of Instagram and all the shareable things? I mean, I think I'm going to tangent, but a little but bit before. Yeah, that. and and curiously, I think it happened sort of. Uh, 2008 is when Michael Pollan wrote The Omnivore's Dilemma. Mm. And that book changed everything because it told us all about what was actually going on on farms with cows and corn. And, and everyone was like, oh my God, right? It was the first time it was collected. And he is a wonderful journalist and writer and did a beautiful job of sort of presenting that. Mm -hmm. But that, in my opinion, cracked open a lot of questions about how are we cooking? Because that was the moment we all started being like, we got to think about where our food comes from. We got to think about miles and distance and climate and CO, you know what I mean? And all of that. And then there was like, to me, that seemed an emergence of people really investing themselves in thinking about what they're eating and where they're going. I mean, for sure, Instagram and social media, like, there's like an exponential. <laughs> you know, we all do like these photo shoots when we get our food. Of how that all happened. Yeah. But I think. 
um, I think that that moment, 2008, 2010, mm -hmm. was when it became part of the public conversation, mm -hmm. right? We started seeing food issues on the cover of magazines, which was a first, uh, in, you know what I mean, in, t in times. Uh, and I think that's when that started people's just attention towards it. Mm -hmm. Well, what inspired you to get into food? Ha, uh, well, I say, like, people, people want to hear a story about me sitting at my mother's feet and all this drama, <laughs> sure, you know what I mean, all this beautiful. But at the same time, I'm the oldest female child in an Indian family, so there's no way I was escaping the kitchen, right? That's just a given. But after spending my youth with my mom and my aunties in the kitchen, I did not know how to cook Indian food by the time I, like, left home, university, that sort of thing. That was the alchemy that they did, mm -hmm. and I just went and asked them to cook for me when I wanted any of it. Then I went to live in India after university before I could figure out my life. I was in the mountains going for walks and eating mangoes and being feeling very happy <laughs> As with you myself, do. right? Very happy with myself. <laughs> but the people there who worked in the kitchen were like, what is going on? Who are you? What is happening? Do you know how to cook? TikTok, who's going to marry you? I was 24 already <laughs> getting stale on the shelf. And they were like, please. What? They thought they were going to save me from a life of who knows what, you know? So they, dra they dragged me into the kitchen and I did their work that night, right? And I was rolling, I was kneading dough for chapatis. And I remember I was like, I was on my haunches, right? And they were like, uh, they were surveying me like prospective mothers-in-law. You know what I mean? They're, whether I would be good enough for their sons. It was a whole trial moment. And in the midst of all of that, in this kitchen where I'm sitting cross-legged barefoot on the floor chopping vegetables, I fell deeply in love. I was uh. like, wait, this could be a job. And so I sent a proclamation home to my parents that I was to be a chef. <laughs> they were not interested <laughs> at all. Uh, so I had to argue, I argued my point and here we are and everything is cool. But it was, uh, I was like, oh wait, yeah. wait, I love this, <laughs> right? That's amazing. Yeah. And I know you want to say something. I'll come back to you in a second. Sure. Um, I just want to go to Marie really quickly. Uh, what inspired you to get into food, Marie? Well, I started dating a chef, so... Nice! <laughs> I feel like that could be its own That's little segment. Good we could, we could talk its about own. that Dang. as a whole what to do, what not to do sort of situation. <laughs> Um, but for me, it was really about finding a sense of belonging. Mm. So culturally, I grew up in a Haitian household. We ate Haitian food. And food was like a language. You know, the type of food we, that we ate and that we cooked didn't exist anywhere outside my house. Um, we grew, I grew up in Barrie. There's not really any Haitian restaurants in that area. Even Toronto, we're ju we just have a few here. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't any Haitian food in grocery stores, right? So my home was like this little hub where mm. I felt safe and I felt seen and understood um, and then when I left my home I kind of lost that yeah. you know I moved to Toronto and at the time there were no Haitian restaurants um, and it culturally just kind of fell apart a little bit um, and it was really meeting my partner who's now my husband by the way I'm just like nice. there's a happy ending yes. there um, meeting my partner and uh, not only exploring food with him as a chef because he was curious about Haitian food um, but also I'm half Scottish and he's Scottish and so understanding the other part of my heritage through food as well and we've worked together uh, we, we ran a catering company for 10 years but we also have a pop-up that we do as well mm -hmm. it's sort of a marriage of those two cultures and it's a really fun way to explore the sense of self. And you wanted to say something? Oh, it was just um, to, to Joshua's yeah. point about when food became cool. I mm. think, I think, yes, social media, and I think, yes, Michael Pollan for sure. I think even before that, though, food TV had yes. such yes. played I such a big sure. role in making food yep. cool, in bringing like food and kind of this is celebrity chef culture. Yes. All of that I think yes. was was tremendously influential, um, and beyond just kind of bringing food and cooking to the masses. I think what Food TV had a really big part in doing was prior to Food TV, I think that cooking and, 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 and food was very much viewed as being part of the kind of female, yeah. the kind of domestic world. Mm -hmm. And while that wasn't necessarily true in professional kitchens, you know, there were a lot of men working mm -hmm. in, in professional kitchens, I think that until Food TV, until there were people like Bobby Flay and and, and uh, Emeril Lagasse on TV. Emeril for sure. Yeah, right? making the food and making it look cool. And like, you know, these yeah. like bad boy, yeah. like that, I think, very much had to do with that yep, moment. What sure. about Nigella Lawson and Martha Stewart? Oh, for like, sure. Nigella, my yeah. goodness, right? Yeah. 
Just the, she, I think she made it enticing because mm. people were like, who is this woman, mm -hmm. right? And the fact that at the end of the early days, she, the, the end of her show involved her tromping down to the fridge and just sticking her finger in something for a <laughs> little, right? They, they formalized it a little bit more, which lost some of its charm, uh, right? But the fact that she talked right into the camera with those bedroom eyes while making a salad. <laughs> People and the like hair. didn't know what happened, right? And the People hair. People didn't know what happened to themselves <laughs> when they, yeah. Well, what makes something delicious? I mean, it might sound like a really weird uh, question to ask because I think we all have different uh, preferences um, and different likes. But Joseph, to you, like, what makes something delicious? I really want to make sure that whatever my mother and my grandmother instilled in me when in terms of cooking makes anything I do taste very good mm -hmm. because I try to bring that mentality and that 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 charm and and that that flavor into it and i was always told that no matter what you cook and how you're feeling at that specific time it, the person eating it will actually feel feel that so if you're eating something rushed if you're rushing in the kitchen and you're frustrated your plate's going to look messy and it's not going to taste as good mm -hmm. versus if you're just taking your time putting a lot of love and attention into it that dish is going to taste very delicious. It's going to taste. It's going to taste like home. That's why your mother's and your grandmother's cooking will never taste like yours because they put that love and attention into that dish to nourish their children, right? And that's something that I try to do every day. And that's something that I teach my son. That's something that I teach my students. Is if you're having a bad day, order out. Right. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh my God! What a lovely thing. Yeah. Versus, yes. Yeah. It's so interesting what you said about uh, what you put in the food is what it tastes like because I was born in East Africa, and my auntie always said that if you're angry or if you don't yes. want to do it, yes. that's when the food will like taste bitter yes. or she might burn her tongue. She's like, "Were you angry doing this?" Yeah. I'm like, "I know, no, I wasn't." But that's so interesting how so like different cultures have that kind of perception because I think we always think about the senses, right? Do the senses play any? Um, do they play a role in huge. how the food is? How yeah, a huge role. Huge. Um, yeah. Back when we had Kokum, just not too far from here, um, we uh, we did a just our, our pre-night service, just invited friends and family, people that helped us build the restaurant. Nice. And we had um, a a daughter and I think well, two family members, two, both females. They were sitting at a table, and then they had the dessert, and then they just started crying while they were sitting there. Mm. And then our waiter, the waitress, went up to them and said, "Is there something wrong with your dish?" Yeah. Like, no, no. This the way that this creme brulee is presented and taste. It tastes exactly the way my grandmother's house smelled. Oh. Right? Because we infuse it with sweet How grass. Beautiful that you right? had the chance yeah. to do that for them, yeah. though, right? Oh, I love so I think it. that's what makes a food delicious. Mm. In my in my eyes is is the memories that it can bring onto you when you're eating something. Right? Marie? Absolutely. I've had a very similar experience, but um, when I had first started dating my partner, um, he was like, yeah, I'm a chef. And I was like, okay, you're a chef. And I was thinking like, <laughs> you're a it. chef, like your friends in a band, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 sure, yeah. cool, cool, yeah, you're a chef, like great. And he picked me up from work. I used to work at a call center, so he's picking me up at like 11.30 at night. I haven't eaten. And he is rummaging through my fridge and he's putting something together and he hands it to me and I'm like, okay, cool. And I'm just biting into it. And I'm like, this is, this is in my fridge? And this is delicious? And you're, you're like a chef, <laughs> like a real <laughs> chef. And he's just looking at me saying, of course, I, I said I was a chef. I'm like, no, but you're really like a real chef, like a real. You're like a lead singer. Like a real, yeah, like, <laughs> like okay, I'll go to the concert, I get it, cool, cool, I'll, I'll eat whatever you're making. Um, but I think going back to the question, which was what makes things delicious, um, my grandmother always said like, Sagan like, bon sel. Things have good salt, so they have to be well seasoned. Mm. Well seasoned food. Lovely. Mm. You cannot have delicious food without well seasoned food, whether it is salt or whatever else needs to go in there. But there needs to be some kind of so no extra chicken. love. No, no, none of that. Like, there's so many TikToks and so many social media where it's just a boiled piece of chicken breast, no love, right? No, <laughs> no skin. About no salt. People boasting about the fact that there's hey. no salt in the cooking. I'm like, mm -hmm. no salt means no love. No, and there no needs flavor. To be, and no I'm sorry, flavor. there needs to be some salt. What if you can't eat salt? What, like, what makes, <laughs> I mean, there's other you, things you can do, but let's only do that in extreme circumstances. <laughs> well, what makes things delicious to you, Anne? I mean, it's, it's such a big question, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, I, I, 
I, I think that the way that it's sometimes viewed in food media and portrayed on like food TV is that there is this idea that something is delicious and something is not delicious, like that, that there is some kind of standard right. uh, for, for delicious yeah. food. Um, you know, like biologically, we know that sure, you know, babies prefer, uh, we as humans want sugar, we want fat, yeah. you know, that, that is part of like our, our survival. Yes, so th that is a biological fact, but I think beyond that, I mean, everything is just so, so, so personal, right? It, it has to do with what you ate growing up. It has to do with uh, the culture that you come from, the household, where you grew up, all of these different things to even, like even to the, to the, to the point where, you know, I as a full grown woman now, uh, I grew up in a McDonald's household, as in that was our family's choice when right. we were going, you know, to, from one lesson to, to the next to go through a drive through we would go to McDonald's and we would have, you know, McDonald's uh, hamburger and, and French fries. And so now as a grown up, like that to me still is like the standard for mm. what tastes delicious. And those kinds of things, I think you, you just can't, they're just so personal and and so deeply ingrained in, in all of us that mm -hmm. it's just you know food and and flavor perception it's experience it's it's yeah. personal preference it's all of it's culture it's whether or not we've traveled it's a moment it's of all the day of also yeah. mm -hmm. you're fishing mm -hmm. for nostalgia mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right well last year 2022 there was a lot of news in Toronto because uh, the excitement was that Toronto would receive um, a Michelin right. starred restaurants yes, right yes. and I think in total there was 13 and yes. most of them were in like really fancy areas like Yorkville. Um, I'm from Scarborough. <laughs> I'm claiming Scarborough like I've been there for 40 years. I've been there for two years. <laughs> but I was like, Scarborough has so much good food. But it was kind of like not really on the list. So do we still need something like a Michelin guide to say, okay, this is what's delicious. This is what people uh, should aspire to, what chefs should aspire to. Joshna? Uh, no, mm. no, I mean, great. Uh, I'm not that fussed about Michelin stars. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's great because I have colleagues who really are, right? And Canadian chefs that used to never be part of the dream, uh, and now it is, and I think that's lovely for those who are chasing them. That's great. Mm -hmm. But really, like, not, none of this stuff tells you anything about how delicious the food is, no. uh, in my opinion. Right, in my opinion, because you can take, right, Joseph, so you mentioned this, even the most humble ingredients, uh, and it's the attitude and the approach that you take to put it together uh, that works, right? That that makes, that blooms something into deliciousness. Uh, what Michelin is like, it's like that whole sort of world of fine dining uh, and the parade of plates and the, you know what I mean? The sort of the choreography and the performance of it all. Uh, but I don't know that that has, that there's any advantage or higher deliciousness Mm. happening in those restaurants and dining rooms than what could be happening in your grandmother's kitchen. But I mean, it's for us, like if you're outside of the food world, it's yeah. like, oh, if I can get a reservation at that yeah. Michelin starred no, restaurant, I mean, that's like, that's a, it. It's such a hit and miss. I've had some, I've had a couple of really disappointing meals at Michelin star, mm -hmm. mostly feeling like I needed to stop for a burger on the way home after, <laughs> right? Uh, which is like, after that much money has left my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can smell the fries. I <laughs> stop for a burger after it feels insane, right? But it's like, like for me, d like deliciousness. I was thinking about this. I think the one thing maybe we haven't talked about is. Uh, how things are grown. Mm. We're going to get to that right? in a second. Uh, right, and that that organic and those flavors, mm -hmm. really like organic vegetables versus co conventional ones, have dramatic difference in mm -hmm. flavor. But to this other point, I mean, and this is, I think, where the magic of restaurants is. To me, delicious food comes from somebody else's hands. Mm. Right, that's mothers, grandmothers, that's dedicated cooks, people who care for you. Right, there's something that happens. I think about this a lot with pasta. Mm -hmm. There's something glorious about being given a beautifully made plate of pasta that, oh, it is like somebody loves me. <laughs> and this is a good scenario right now, you know? <laughs> well, it, Joseph, you know, you're a chef. It, would you turn down a Michelin star? Uh, honestly, yes, I would, mm -hmm. yeah. Just because um, the whole Michelin system mm -hmm. is designed to attract new people to either that establishment or like the city of Toronto. Right, to attract more people to come in. I already think that Toronto itself, before the Michelin system came in, was already a food destination yep. versus because we're so multicultural here, and especially in Vancouver too, who just got their Michelin system That's too cool. as well. Um, we're so multicultural that there's a lot of these great little restaurants out there, like Scarborough. There's so many in Scarborough. Mm -hmm. Like, I, 
In the strip I, malls, right? Yeah, in yeah. the strip oh, malls. Percent. Like, yes. I would rather get, uh, if there was a Michelin star restaurant next to a, a pupusa stand, I would go to the pupusa stand yes. because I know that is actually made with love and attention versus a place that was just made to retain that one star or two star mm -hmm. or three stars, right? So, three. and honestly, I don't technically want to be given a star and be recognized by a tire company. <laughs> 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 <Isn't that laughs> <Yeah. It's not. laughs> um, I wanted to um, kind of change gears a little bit. Yeah. Um, uh, so when I uh, I lived in a refugee camp for a little bit, and uh, I, the meal that we had, I still crave yeah. and I still love going back to the nostalgia, which is just uh, it's called ugali. It's kind of like polenta, mm -hmm. fufu. Um, basically like flour and water. And then on special days, we had like uh, tomatoes and onion put in the yes, flour mix yes. and it was just delicious. But then for protein, uh, because we're in a camp, we would eat uh, weevils, like weevil bugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and for a lot of people, a lot of those uh, reality shows, in order to make it to the next <laughs> step, you must eat yeah, yeah, this yeah, yeah. insect. <laughs> and uh, you know, there's, there's a reaction. I mean, would I eat them now? I to be honest with you, I'll probably be like, I, I don't know, maybe mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. um, but what about our, so I wanted to talk about our perception or misconceptions of food that are unconventionally, people get grossed out by, yeah. quote, unquote. <sighs> Well, oh, I think, <laughs> and then Josh and I just looking at each other like, things. yeah, no. I got a bunch of things. I got a bunch of things about this. I, I bring this up with my students a mm. lot because uh, I'm teaching formally, but I also like used to teach kids classes at the farmer's market on Saturday mornings, right? So like nine to 12 year olds uh, and their parents would shop and the kids would come and hang out with me. And at the beginning of each class, uh, of the session, I had me and an easel and I had rules of the kitchen, no running, keep your finger out of your nose, all that kind of, right? But at the end, it was like, we respect this space, we respect each other, and we respect this food. And I had a very, very sharp line with them about the fact that I had no tolerance for anybody tasting something and making a face mm. and running to spit it out or being like, ah, that's disgusting. I was like, absolutely not. Because food means something to everybody and you must respect it. Even if you don't, you don't have to like it, but you have to engage with it and you have to respect everything. You cannot look at something and snarly up your face. That's disrespectful and it's just not tolerated here. And I, my grown students, I have the same policy with them, right? Because yes, the, but like, if you had to, you would eat those weevils again, <laughs> you know? And you mm -hmm. ate them because you had to. Yeah, and it kept me alive. This is it, right? And let's be grateful to those creatures for existing and for that system to be there mm -hmm. so that you are here with us now, right? It's really, really, really important that we open up our thinking uh, and, not and not relegate these things. Because the other side of it is, like my, my tradition, lots of different animal parts. When meat eating happens, we go deep, right? There's a very serious, meat veg divide in Indian culture, but when you're eating meat, you're sucking bones, you know what I mean? And you're getting, and there's the notion that you have to, the chicken breast is only one part of this thing. Who's gonna eat those feet? Who's gonna, you know what I mean? We need to embrace the fact that eating potentially weird bits is actually more respectful, sustainable way to consume, particularly animals. And you can't just eat the designer no, parts, the right? the tenderloins, right, exactly. Exactly. Um, we, our pop-up's called Voodoo Haggis, and we call it that because there are two parts of my culture that people have strong opinions towards but don't know anything about. <laughs> and haggis is one of those things where people are like, ew, haggis. I was like, have you ever had a sausage? Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm like, okay. You know that lining? That's intestinal lining. I'm like, oh, yeah. Haggis, you don't eat that part. We just carry it in that. And then we fry it up, you boil it, you do all the things to it. Um, but I think people hear sheep stomach and they're like, no, thank you. Yeah. But they don't understand what process it is in that. And people don't really understand their food, yep. right? People don't cook, they don't understand what goes into their food. Mm -hmm. They'd be floored if they knew half the stuff that went into the food that they ate. We're gonna talk about that <laughs> shortly. Um, but Anne and Joseph, did you wanna add anything before we uh, wrap up our conversation? Yeah, I mean, I, I would be surprised if any of us at this table doesn't have that, that kind of cliched memory of being in the lunchroom at school or in cafeteria and taking something out of our lunch bag and, and you know, having other people uh, laugh at it or, or, or point at it or say, oh, that smells funny. You know, I grew up eating chicken feet and cow stomach and that was perfectly normal mm -hmm. in my household. Um, 
the, that feeling and, and those feelings of like shame, I think that they, they, they are like in our bones now. I am happy to say that it feels like the younger generations, Gen Z, like on social media, mm -hmm. it seems like the language is getting better yep. at describing right. foods. I mean, the, the, the meme is, is, you know, don't yuck my yum. That's, it. That's a very, That's very, it. very popular yeah. thing that, you know, the younger generations, I think they're a little bit more conscious of, of, of how to have those conversations in a more respectful way, and that gives me hope. Um, but, but yeah, I think there's still a lot of work to do because even, even in mainstream media, we still see a lot of language that I think is kind of harmful and, and just not very thoughtful. Yep. And Joseph? Yeah, so I, I was very fortunate enough to grow up foraging and hunting for my own food, right? Mm. So versus if like, um, I know a lot of my students, they're international students, uh, just like Joshua's students are very international. So they have a lot of curiosity of where our food comes from yeah. traditionally. Mm -hmm. So in my classes, I talk about going foraging, going hunting, using the whole animal, right? All the way from hoof to snout or sure but the nose or whichever <laughs> way you want to measure it, right? So, um, but I was very fortunate enough to to have that in my life and now that's something I'm teaching my son. And it's, I remember when we got our first moose together, me, my wife and our son, we, uh, uh, for better lack of terms, we, we, we dressed it out there right, just right where we shot it and yeah. and he was he wasn't phased by it or anything he right. took it in right. he absorbed all the information as much as possible and let's just like um in my culture especially where i come from it's like when you take your your first um your first kill it's you have to you you, you drink a little bit of their their blood or you just stick their the your finger and their blood and just you taste it. Yeah. But then it gives you that level of respect towards that animal's life that you, you just took to sustain yourself mm -hmm. and your family. So in terms of uh, that style of of living, I don't wanna say style, but traditionally that, that's what we did is like, um, is hunting and foraging is the way we sustained our size for a millennia. Now I get to teach that for my, to my son and to my students. It's, mm -hmm. it's very important to me and it's very important to my family. We, we do this moose hunt every single year mm -hmm. around when my grandmother passed away around Thanksgiving weekend where we all go out for a week and the whole family's out there. We can come and go when we, whenever we want mm -hmm. and we, just, we, we share our harvest. Of what we have. Um, we're, I'm loving this conversation. We're actually going to talk a bit more about culture mm -hmm. and we're going to talk about that tomorrow. So we'll continue our conversation mm -hmm. uh, on how food is a part of culture. Thank you so much. This has been uh, a, a great way to start this week. Yeah, Thank you so thank much. You. Thanks for having us. Our guests all this week are Joseph Shawana, executive chef at Kokum on Manitoulin Island, Joshna Maharaj, chef and author of Take Back the Tray. Anne Huey, reporter at the Global Mail and author of Chop Suey Nation. And food writer Marie Fitrion, who's also program manager at the nonprofit Foodpreneur Lab. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. <laughs>